Welcome back still to come. An extraordinary spray from the ABC's Laura Tingle at a Sydney Writers' Festival. But first, while the Foreign Minister Penny Wong has been more than happy to vote in favour of Palestine at the United Nations, a clear reward to Hamas in spite of their atrocities, it would appear that requests from our actual friends in need fall on deaf ears. Reported today, the Ukrainian government, who directly appealed to Wong in December last year for more coal, six months on, haven't even had the courtesy of a reply. Now, worse still, even if there was a shipment approved, experts say it wouldn't even arrive in time for winter. For more on this, I'm joined now by the Director of Strategic Analysis Australia, Michael Shoebridge. Well, how is it, Michael, that the Palestinians seem to have a hotline to Penny Wong? They were taking in thousands and thousands of people out of Gaza. I'm told that one in every four Palestinians leaving the region are coming to Australia. Very little security checks, as we know. We've overturned seven decades plus of bipartisanship in the UN to reward Hamas. And yet poor old Ukraine can't even get a response to a fairly minor and reasonable request. Well, Peter, you're right. A real test of where a minister and a government's priorities are are where they spend their time. And the Albanese government has got its priorities on Ukraine and Gaza all wrong. So uh, we haven't seen Penny Wong visit Ukraine. We haven't seen the defence minister uh, visit Ukraine. or We haven't seen the embassy reopen in Kiev. They're spending their time uh, signalling support to Hamas by things like supporting a vote for Palestinian statehood at the UN. And no matter what they try to tell us back here at home, Hamas will see these Australian government actions as support. Meanwhile, on Ukraine, the government only supports the Ukrainian military when they're backed into a corner and have to turn up at a big NATO or G20 meeting. We need to see the government switch its priorities and focus on supporting mm. Ukraine with the things we can give them. What did you make of the facts, though, that have come out today, despite all of our tough talk about Russia and signing on to, to world sanctions? We've had about a billion dollars worth of trade, Australia, with Russia. I was shocked that we're still even trading with them. Yes, well, this is certainly an Australian problem, but it's also a democratic world problem. At the start of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, we all acted decisively, but we've lost focus and we've let Putin strengthen his economy and turn his economy to war production, and we've done very little about it. So Australia should be a leading nation in tightening and broadening sanctions against Russia, and I'd like to see a bit of sanctions enforcement from the government too. What about the, the meeting of the finance ministers at the G7? I think this is important. We know with the sanctions, there's money being held, assets being frozen of a whole lot of oligarchs and uh, banks, uh, the, the trading of, of central banks that's being held back. 300 billion, we're told, is sort of the, the number. Now, there was a debate that that money could be given to Ukraine to finance its war against Russia. That was put into abeyance. It looks like that's back on the table to debate. Where do you think that's going to go? Well, Peter, I think... The financial heft that Russia has that's held in other countries that are sanctioning it needs to be used to support Ukraine. Uh, this should be seen as a punitive measure against Russia where their wealth is used against them. And maybe it should be seen like a sovereign wealth fund for Ukraine. So uh, the, all the interest that it oh, earns good idea. supports U Ukraine's fight. Good idea, because the only other option is to give it back to them. And, of course, no-one will support that uh, until Ukraine's free. Uh, Cy Quantum, I'm very dubious about any process uh, that picks winners for government that, that hands away a billion dollars uh, to a mob in California. I think it worked it out to be about $2.5 million per job that will eventually be based in Brisbane. But we find out today, too, significant links between Cy Quantum and Chinese academics and Chinese experts. Given how opaque this whole process has been, Michael, this concerns me a hell of a lot. Well, the Chinese want to get in on the ground floor with quantum computing. It's a huge 
state priority for Xi Jinping and his government. And we know how ruthless he is in getting Chinese academics and researchers to hand over all of their intellectual property and any they can steal from anyone else. So due diligence here is essential. I think there's still some naivety in our scientific and research communities about science is for everyone. If you live in China or you return to China and you have quantum computing skills, the state and the Chinese military and intelligence services will get hold of you. And everyone uh, that's getting Australian government money needs to understand that. But also if we're building a system from the ground up and we've got Chinese academics and others involved in that, how confident are we? It's a bit like a house being built and the foundations at the bottom are crook. How confident are we that down the track they haven't got sort of a, a backdoor way to get into the system, to, to find out the information we're putting through the system, our quantum uh, computing system when it's up and running? I mean, that would be my fear. Um, I agree with you. I, I would think any Chinese researcher uh, that has already studied at one of their defence or military universities or who is doing quantum research and wants to return to China, they shouldn't be associated mm, mm. with the quantum computing effort that any of Australian taxpayer mo ta taxpayers' money is going into. I agree with you. Now, I'm sure you weren't shocked this morning. You know your stuff. I wasn't shocked because I was there for the mop-up that had to happen afterwards. But uh, everyone out there in the real world knows now that uh, from 2009 to 2012, when Labor was running the show, we had basically no submarines that we could put to water to defend ourselves. This, this is a national crime. Yes, Peter, it is. And the problem is we're going to go through another very difficult period with the Collins submarines and the transition to the nuclear submarines. So we've got to have confidence that the government knows what it's doing and that it's pushing the Defence Department to do a better job than it did back in 2012, 2016 with the Collins. And the government's passion for secrecy and covering up things that the Australian public should know doesn't give me any confidence. Well, there's lots of things I can't talk about on this show even now after the event, but I'm glad that's out in the open. I think that should be critical in our whole debate about how quickly we get these Virginia-class subs from America and I think the fanciful notion that we're going to build some here. Michael, thank you as always.